Shall we start, sir? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, one and all. I heartily welcome all of you in the sequel of historical and pioneering Langley's online lecture series. At the outset, with the team of Langley, need to thank all the participants for your love, words of appreciation, blessings, academic support, and overwhelming response. Most of us uh, are the part of this historical journey started well back on 20th April 2020, and now we have reached. to the milestone by conducting 51 sessions of a well known national and international academicians who have spoken on various aspects of language literature criticism ict e content and effect of covid-19 on higher education your regular attendance proves that you have quest for knowledge in this pandemic situation too even though we are locked down we are not down langley's uh, platform provided uh, one of its kind in mutual teaching learning experience and reached to 40000 views on youtube channel till today and more than 2000 english professors teachers and research scholars are benefited by this lecture series in addition to that is not the end of lecture series it's just a new beginning we will arrange such lecture series and invite national and international uh, academicians to deliver their talks on various aspects of language and literature there are certain instructions for the interested participants who want certificate we are giving entire series one unique certificate to the interested participants only Part because our purpose is to share knowledge and uh, is a free no registration is required but those interested participants need to fill the form and send their zoom participation screenshot or youtube channel language educators uh, subscription screenshot where you have watched all these videos to the email id e language motivators at the rate gmail.com or you can whatsapp me uh, at 0989029060 kindly keep in touch don't forget the to subscribe the channel so that you will get notifications about further academicians uh, speech so let's uh, share and grow together friends today we have with us a well known nationally acclaimed academician professor atnu bhattacharya sir professor atnu bhattacharya sir is the school of language literature and cultural uh, culture studies at central university of gujarat gandhinagar he completed his studies from jawala nehru university new delhi and the university of warwick uk his research interests are focused on uh, the interaction between technology studies english language studies and cultural studies his current research interests are specifically in the area of bengali science fiction as it developed during on the 19th century in and around the city of kolkata he is at present working on a book project on science fiction in colonial spaces as well as on ict and language education he is an amateur theater enthusiast and in his leisure time tries to write plays so without further delay it's my honor and privilege to invite professor atnu bhattacharya sir to deliver his talk on researching minor genres some reflections over to you sir uh, thank you very much uh, dr mathe this uh, it has been a pleasure to come over here and deliver this webinar i must first thank you for having me for this webinar because uh, so we have been in communication for a very long time now and uh, we have been trying to arrange this some or the other it couldn't get done so thank you for having me today uh i'll just share the screen in case because we are, i'm going to go through very quickly through a powerpoint presentation yes sir so that uh, uh we are all on the same page basically yes sir uh your ppt is visible no problems so is it all right now is uh, yes, sir. i think yes, sir. you can see it yeah yes yes uh now as you can see the topic of uh, today's talk is researching minor genres uh, 
and therefore I think it is important that I kind of explain before I begin what I mean by minor genres and what uh, what do I mean by researching minor genres. Uh, now I must tell you uh, what I propose to do today is to kind of provide an outline for possible research areas uh, and a kind of research practice that has not been very popular in India. Uh, especially in departments of English. So at uh, departments of English, we have tended to be a bit more canonical, though we have moved away from it uh, in the last uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, but we have still not really moved away completely from it. So we have not looked into minor genres uh, in great details. So this is what uh, specifically I'm going to look at and uh, what uh, I'll explain what I mean by minor genres a bit later. Now, this outline, of course, this is a very, uh, not a very detailed outline that I'm going to give you. We don't have the time for that. But, uh, and these are, of course, not clear cut solutions in terms of uh, what I want to do today. But these are some thoughts that I think uh, we can all take home and think about them and ponder about them, uh, etc. Uh, my focus today, as I told you, uh, is minor genres and the examples that I take uh, would mostly be from Indian English literature or in some cases Indian literatures in translation. So I'm going to look at translated texts as well. Though my bias uh, would be literature produced in Bengal because that is the region that I understand. So uh, please do excuse me if I give examples from uh, literature from Bengal, but I'm sure that you can uh, uh, kind of uh, relate to it especially when I talk about genres, especially when I talk about uh, different forms of research uh, orientations towards these genres. And I'm sure that you can then relate it to your own regional literatures, your own literatures in translation, and uh, the English literature that is produced around your own region. Now, I've chosen Bengal because that is, that is a place, that is a region that I can at least claim to understand a bit. And... Uh, uh, my bias is also towards the historical understanding of these literature. So when I'm looking at minor genres, I'm just not going to look at one particular part of the minor genre or one a specific historical period of the minor genre, but I'm going to look at it in a more uh, uh, in a more serialized historical fashion. So that's what I'm planning to do. So. Uh, what, uh, as I've already told you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on minor genres in Indian literatures, again, in English and in translation. Uh, I'll also briefly see how they have been studied because some of the minor genres that I'm going to look at have been studied a bit over the last 15 years or 20 years. And then I'm going to look at a possible case study, just as an example of how we can go about studying minor genres. Now, let me also uh, tell you right at the outset that uh, when I say minor genres, I'm going to look at only prose genres. I'm not going to look at uh, poetry at all, uh, which is a bit of a letdown, but uh, that is what uh, the focus of today's talk is. So I'm just going to look at prose, mostly fictional prose and not even nonfiction. Uh, no, I will also say that I will draw from different generic forms. So we will look at different kinds of genres rather than one single genre. So the case study uh, that I'm going to look at at the end of the talk is, uh, is from one particular genre. Though within that genre itself, there are lots of variations. Uh, so I'm going to look at minor genres, I'm going to look at prose genres, and I'm going to look at different types of minor genres that are available. Now, before we start with minor genres, I think it is important to understand what, what am I pitching it against. So, uh, if it is a minor genre, there has to be some sort of a major genre. Now, we know that uh, in Indian literature in English and in Indian English literature uh, or in translation, the major focus has been on, uh, on the novel form. So right from the 19th century, the focus, if you look at uh, novels like Indulekha, which is considered to be the first novel in Indian languages, or Yamuna Pariyatan, there is a bit of a debate uh, whether this novel written in 1857 was the first novel, uh, or uh, Anand Mad by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, or even in uh, Indian English writing, Raj Mohan's wife by Bankim again, uh, which is considered to be the first uh, novel in English, 
you, you have a certain kind of a, uh, a huge amount of focus on uh, the novel form and the development of the novel form, uh, whether uh, it is a novel written in English or a novel written in English translation, so Kanduleka or Ananmat and how the novel drew from Western genres of the novel, how it interacted with the Western genres of the novel, uh, etc. So the major focus of research on uh, Indian literatures, especially uh, if you look at it historically, has been uh, in the field of the novel. Uh, now we know that the novel form has been extremely flexible. So it, there is nothing called one type of novel. There have been different types of novel. If I go back to Bengali literature, the earliest novels that you see, uh, which were sometimes called Katha or Akhaika, uh, later the word Upanyas was used for Bengali novels, which is another interesting history because the novel in Marathi, for example, was called the Kadambari. Um, the novel in Hindi was called the Upanyas, etc. Uh, so the novel in India was very different from the Western realistic novel, and we know that. Uh, so if you go back to Bengal again, some of the early novels that developed in Bengal were actually historical novels. So most of the early novels that you see in Bengal were mostly historical novels, and they were not the realistic novel that we understand by the novel form in the West. Uh, and so if you look at the development of the novel form itself, it is not one sort of development. Different regions developed different kinds of the novelistic form, and they reacted to the Western novel form in different ways. But uh, exclusively almost, uh, most of the early research in Indian English writing or Indian literature and translation has been on the novel form. Uh, now, if this is taken as a major genre, now we have to accept that the novel form was a major genre. Uh, and the novel did some very, very interesting things in terms of Indian writing. So we will have to uh, accept the fact that uh, the novel was a kind of a very interesting form in itself. And we can have a complete webinar on the novel form itself. But my uh, intention is not that today. My intention is to move away from the novel form and to look at uh, a different kind of uh, form that came into, or different sorts of forms that came into existence during this period. Uh, and if you look at the three examples that are given on this slide, they were all from the 19th century. So you want to start with the 19th century and then probably come to the 20th century by the end of the presentation. Now, as I told you, and as I warned you, uh, most of my examples are going to come from Bengal. But I'm sure that you can relate uh, to the examples that I'm giving to something that is happening in your own regional literatures. Uh, now, some of the early genres that developed in Bengal were actually not novels at all. And they were very different kinds of genres that developed. Now, they were autobiographies, testimonies, and memoirs. I've given you an example of all the three. Uh, the last one that you see, which is known as Amar Jibon, or My Story, is by someone called Rasundari Devi which is considered to be one of the earliest autobiographies written by a woman in the 19th century, uh, was actually more of a testimony rather than an autobiography. Rasundari Devi herself could not write. So she actually told the story to someone and that someone else wrote down the story for her. So it was more of a testimony rather than an autobiography. Now, uh, this was... Uh, around 1876. So we have the earliest forms that develop much even before the novel form almost comes into existence are these kinds of forms that develops in Bengal. And I'm sure that you can find similar kind of examples in your own region literatures. Uh, the second example that I've given, the other two examples that I've given over here is a diary, actually again, a kind of an autobiographical memoir um, that was written by Sarala Devi Chaudhurani who was one of the earliest freedom fighter, a woman freedom fighter uh, from Bengal. She uh, ran a, a pan-Indian organization for women's education. And uh, this is where she uh, came into, uh, she actually belonged to the famous Tagore family of Bengal. She was the daughter of um, Rabindranath Tagore's elder sister. And her mother herself was a very well-known writer. Uh, 
uh, Shonda Kumari Devi, and she herself wrote about her own experience in her women's education uh, in, the, in the form of the memoir. Uh, the third example, which is the first in the slide, is uh, from uh, an actor, a very well-known actor in Bengali theater called Binodini Dasi, and she wrote her kind of an autobiography, come memoir, come testimony, almost at the end of her life, which was again called uh, Amar Jivon, which is my story. Uh, and uh, she talked about her experiences as a theater actor, her uh, aspirations, her dreams, her disappointments, etc. Uh, some amount of work has happened in these genres, uh, especially some interests have been shown in the last 15, 20 years in these minor genres that developed over a period of time. Uh, and now there is some substantial amount of literature available on these genres. Uh, now, they still remain minor genres because they, are, they still do not have the same amount of attention, for example, that uh, was, uh, that has been given to the novel form. Now, it's interesting that uh, when these genres came into existence, all of them around the 19th century, uh, mid 19th century, uh, you take Rasundari Devi or Sarada Devi Chaudhurani or Binodini Dasi, uh, all these genres came into existence because uh, in the 19th century, what happened was there was an explosion of print culture. So print as a medium became an important aspect of the culture at that point of time. Uh, and because of that explosion, uh, you had different sorts of things happening. So on the one hand, you had vernacular languages producing or the regional languages producing a large amount of writings, letters, memoirs, autobiographies, etc. But also because of the explosion of the print culture, women's education became an important issue, and women started writing uh, these forms of genres. Uh, and we can again keep on talking about this for a very long time. But I would like you to keep this in mind that these were some of the earliest genres that came into existence when print culture uh, started in the 19th century, especially in Bengal. With the emerging of the new middle class, of course, and as you can see, uh, except Binodini Dasi, who came from a disadvantaged uh, noti, uh, what is known as a nutty tradition. Uh, the other two writers came from pretty well to do families, uh, had access to education, and these were the people who started writing these kind of minor genres. And therefore, this, this can be seen as a subculture in Bengal at that point of time. Uh, Another uh, very minor genre that came into existence at that point of time, again, was uh, the travelogues. And I'm sure that some of you uh, were, uh, some of you must have learned or heard about these travelogues. The first one is of Deen Muhammad, which was um, uh, published way back in 1794. Now, if you know the story of Deen Muhammad, Deen Muhammad was, uh, was a man from Bengal who traveled to England, actually settled down over there in 1810, uh, opened one of the earliest Indian restaurants in London um, called the Hindustani Coffee House, uh, which was a kind of a business failure. And he was the one who is supposed to have brought shampoo to London. So he brought in the skill of champu, what is not known as champi. So the champi became shampoo and he became a very successful businessman, got married over there and died over there. He actually wrote this Travels of Din Muhammad um, in English, one of the earliest um, travelogues written in English by an Indian, though he was in England at that point of time and his own experiences uh, of England at uh, that point of time. Uh, but of course, you had also women traveling because of access to education. And uh, one of the earliest uh, that you can find is actually in 1885, uh, which is uh, by someone called Krishna Bahini Das. Uh, who traveled and studied in England for some time. And uh, she uh, wrote a travelogue about her own experiences in London. The third example that I've given over here is uh, the most famous one uh, by Fanny Fox, who is an English woman who traveled to Bengal in character, uh, stayed over there for a very long time, I think around 30 years, and talked about her own experiences of Calcutta and Bengal and her travel around the country. Now, this is again something that has um, kind of interested people in terms of research, because these are, again, minor genres that have not, not many people have looked into. Uh, quite a lot of interest has been generated, especially from different regions of the country now in India, uh, where people are kind of looking into uh, 
the different sorts of minor genres that developed during this period of time. Uh, I know in Maharashtra, for example, <clears throat> a lot of interest has been generated in travelogues and across the country, travelogues is becoming a major research area because a large number of people, because of its contact with the West, traveled abroad and wrote about their own experiences. <clears throat> now, I promised you that I'm going to show you a case study. Now, the case study that we're going to look at today is a very uh, strange uh, form of writing that came into existence, again, around the same time in 19th century. Uh, and I'm calling it speculative fiction. Well, I'm not calling it speculative fiction. Actually, the term speculative fiction is given by someone called Vandana Singh. Uh, and she calls these uh, writings speculative fiction because she thinks that if you use the word science fiction for these kind of writings, then uh, it does not capture because science fiction is a very Western thing. So instead of calling it science fiction, she says these kind of writings actually look like science fiction, they behave like science fiction, they mirror science fiction in the West, but they're not science fiction in the strict sense of the word. So she calls it but also they are more utopian or a dystopian kind of fiction. They are more about the future. Uh, they, more, they are more about speculation rather than about the science aspect of it. And the three that I have put up on this slide over here are very, very early. So if you look at the last on the slide, a journal of 48 hours of the year 1945, this was written by Kailash Dutta in 1835, one of the probably earliest speculative fiction. Remember, science fiction in the West came into existence only in the 1860s and the 70s. So if you discard uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, which was written in 1818. So what we call science fiction by G. Wells, for example, is that comes into existence only in the 1870s. This is a writing that comes into existence in 1835. Sushi Chandra the first on the slide, uh, writes something called uh, The Republic of Orissa, a page from the annals of the 20th century, which is again a futuristic novel, which is set in 1945, uh, in 1845. So you have these kind of writings, speculative writings that comes into existence. So of course, the middle one is Lokash Akhawat Hussain Sultana's Dream, which some of you might have heard of, which was written in 1905. So you have this huge tradition of writing, which is um, which cannot be really called a novel, which cannot be called either autobiography or memoir or any because these are all prose fiction. These, these are all fictional, but they do not fit into the category of the, what we call the novel form because they are speculative, futuristic, they are fantastic, uh, etc. So it's, they're almost like science fiction. And these kinds of writings have not much, uh, have not been much researched at all in the tradition, uh, as they have been in the West, for example. Now, remember, it does not follow the same generic principles of Western science fiction, but very often closely mirrors it. It's almost like a science fiction, but not a science fiction. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the stories of this, but uh, just to give you a sample of what it would look like, Sultana's Dream, for example, is about a woman who uh, travels to a place called Ladyland, which is an extremely scientifically advanced uh, place where all it's all governed by women. Uh, all the men have been put into prison or they are doing all the household jokes and it's the women who govern through science. Uh, and the experience of the woman in this lady man. So this is how it's a short story. It's kind of a long story. Uh, but this is how uh, these uh, uh, forms of, uh, of this speculative fiction, the form of this speculative fiction develop. And there's a whole tradition of this. I've just given you three examples. In Bengali, there are hundreds of these uh, over a period of a period of 100, 150 years. So what do we do with this? Because we obviously do not have much secondary literature on this kind of fiction. Uh, and how do we research this? How do we uh, access this? So do we consider themselves then to be novels and then treat them as novels? Or do we use a different sort of an understanding to understand these kind of writings? So in this case study, I'll try to kind of uh, 
uh, see how we can go about it very briefly, and then uh, we'll stop and go on for the discussion. Now, one of the problems, as we know, is that uh, these minor genres do not have much secondary literature, as I pointed out. Uh, you would not find much research that has happened in this area. Not many people have written about it. And there's not much material available for analysis of these kinds of texts. But if there are no, there's not much secondary material available, one can always kind of start with the historical context within which these kind of texts were produced and then try to see how we can read them. Now, if we accept the fact that early speculative fiction can be seen as science fiction, if we can see them as science fiction, then one of the starting points for this could be, well, how does modern Western science enter the province of Bengal? So that is what we can look at. So we know that with the coming of the British, a certain kind of science enters Bengal, enters India, and not only Bengal, but India. So what was this kind of science? How did people react to this science? What did people do with this science, etc.? Uh, so that is where we can begin. And then see, because there has been some amount of research available in that. And then see, well, let's now look at the fiction and then see how it interacts with this model of new model of science that has entered with the colonial domain, with the colonial rulers. So what do we do with this uh, new forms of science? Uh, what kind of science uh, existed in our country? Or did we have the scientific model that the West uh, or the colonial rulers brought in? And changes that we make to it? Did we challenge it? Did we negotiate it? Did we accept it? Etc. So we can start from that and then probably come to the fictional part of it, come to the fiction and how the fiction interacted. So as a case study, I'm just trying to show you what happened when science enters, especially when we are looking at speculative fiction. Now we know that science in India, when it came with the colonial rulers, uh, it came in in three ways. One is one can be seen as expansionist science. So science was used to expand the British Empire. Uh, for example, in 19 uh, in 1750 uh, or uh, 1765 or 1757, actually, when uh, Shah Alam, the Mughal emperor, handed over the Diwani of Bengal to Lord Clive, uh, we know that uh, the East India Company established itself in Bengal and then Bihar. In those days, of course, Bengal included Bihar and parts of Assam. And then, of course, the empire started expanding, and it started expanding through different ways. Uh, so, in, and science was one of the important things that was used for this expansion. So, for example, within a span of 50 years, you had, uh, well, about 50, 60 years, you had the railways, uh, one of the most important scientific uh, inventions, discoveries that was introduced. Uh, we had uh, different uh, so Pane Mumbai getting connected, uh, the railways carrying goods from interiors of the country to the harbor so that they can be transferred to the British capital, London, or to other industrial towns, and uh, harbors being developed and those harbors being disconnected through the railways, etc. So we know that science was used for expansion of the empire in different ways. But we also know, for example, that uh, this also required huge amount of communication and so telegraphs were uh, another scientific invention that was introduced in, in India. So telegraphic communication was an important aspect of this development of science. So where people would communicate across regions, across different sorts of uh, uh, places, uh, mostly to control, remember, uh, because telegraphic communication was, uh, in fact, telegraph was one of the most important elements in 1857, the uh, first war of independence. And because the British had control over telegraph, they could immediately convey where armies were traveling. And one of the ways that the mutiny, as it was called by the British historians, was suppressed was because they had access to telegraph. So this was an important scientific uh, intervention in India at that point of time. We also know that science traveled through educational institutions. We know that universities like Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras were established in 1857. We have a long history of how English became an important language through these universities. And it was not only English as a language, but English uh, became a language because many of the early institutions thought 
English had access to scientific knowledge. And therefore, English was not simply because of the language taught you some great wisdom, but because the language had access to scientific knowledge, therefore, uh, English was important. And these universities uh, help in establishing science as a major discipline or scientific knowledge as a major discipline across the country. So this was the second thing that happened uh, in, in India. And the third, uh, so you had all these universities coming up all over the place. And the third kind of science that we can uh, now see historically is that it was an appropriative kind of a science. So a large amount of, this is the picture of Asiatic society in Bengal, in Calcutta it, it still exists. And Asiatic society, one of the primary functions of Asiatic society was to translate. So one of the things that the Asiatic society did was it translated huge amounts of, we know that it translated Bhagavad Gita, it translated uh, uh, Shakuntalam, etc., uh, literature from Sanskrit or Pali or from, uh, not much from regional languages, from Arabic, uh, from Persian, etc. But it also translated a huge amount of scientific things. Uh, into English. So it was also appropriative. Uh, a large number of scientific material that was available in Sanskrit or Arabic or Persian was then translated into English in a certain form. Now we therefore know that science played a very, very significant role in forming what we now know as the colonial domain. So you had expansionist science, you had educational science, you had appropriative science, and that operated in different ways in uh, different parts of the country. Now, did it mean that, now this is all colonial archives. We know that this is, uh, this is all, uh, we know it from the history that was written by the British. We know it from the uh, different kinds of things that was available uh, in the British archives, in the British historical texts. But does it mean that the Indians simply accepted what was given to them? Did Indians respond to it? Did Indians do anything about it? Did they say that, no, we are going to accept this science, we are not going to accept this science, we are going to negotiate this science in a different way? So all these things uh, need to be looked into as well. So if you go back to what we are um, looking at, uh, is that we did have a large number of Indian responses. And that is an important thing to do in this part of this kind of research. So what were the responses of the Indians to this new scientific domain that uh, the colo colonial rulers brought in? Sorry. So what you have is, uh, you have different sorts of responses. I'll go through this very quickly because uh, we have written about it. And uh, if you want, we can share the titles of the writing that we have done. For example, one of the most interesting responses was, did women have a right to study science? And there was a huge debate on this in the 19th century. So do women have a right to science or is science something only meant for men? Uh, which is a very interesting debate that happened actually. Uh, because uh, the nature of science that you have is uh, generally supposed to be a domain of the public intellectual and therefore men had access to it while uh, women did not. And therefore you have a very interesting kind of debate happening around this period about women's science, what sort, sort of science should be given to women or is the role of the women only domestic, etc. So uh, a huge amount of responses to science from the women's perspective uh, is available. Uh, we also have very interesting response in terms of communities. For example, in 1857, especially after uh, the War of Independence or the Indian Mutiny, as it is called, uh, the British followed a very aggressive policy of making sure that uh, the Muslims would not get any jobs, any government jobs in the colonial regime. Uh, and so by 1870s, for example, Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, the founder of Aligarh uh, Society, which later became Aligarh Muslim University, uh, responded by saying that the only way that uh, the community of Muslims can have access to government jobs or government knowledge systems is by accessing science. In fact, one of the things that he did by establishing the Aligarh Society in 1874, I think, is by saying that we should have access to science, we should study science. 
So that was another response at the community level. But of course, you had a different kind of a response from other sorts of people, uh, a large number of scholars who believed that we already had an Indian kind of science. And uh, therefore, the Western science was all terrible. Uh, we should go back to the early science. And uh, one of the examples that I've given over here is Radhakant Dev Bahadur, who was a kind of a king. He was not a king, but kind of a zamindar, uh, who said that uh, we do not need Western science at all. We need to go back to our own traditional forms of science. And that is uh, the best thing that we can do. So you have different sorts of Indian responses to these kinds of science. We have already seen the educational response. But there was also a fifth element, a fifth kind of a response. And this uh, is an interesting one. Uh, it was both, it both accepted the Western science, but at the same time, it found it difficult to accept it. I'll try to explain it very briefly. For example, uh, there was an association which still exists called the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science that came into existence and it came into existence. Uh, it was formed by someone called Mahendra Lal Sarkar. And this is what ISES said. It said that despite the inherited submission to a foreign yoke, we have inherited a mind not inferior in its endowments to the mind of any nation on earth. So it believed that Western science does give you knowledge, but it also believed that it is not our duty to accept whatever they say. It is we need to implement our own scientific principles, our own mind to understand how that science can be best used for our country. So you have a different kind of, so you have acceptance, you accept what Western science is saying, but at the same time, you also say, okay, let's also negotiate. Let's also negotiate our own set. And it is this interesting position that you find in the speculative fiction that I mentioned earlier. So if you look at Kailash Chandradat or Shoshi Chandradat or Rukhaya Shikawa Kusen, they kind of accept Western science as a model of knowledge but they also say that, okay, we accept your model of science, but we also have a mind of our own. We also have our own cultural inheritance. And we will understand your science through that cultural inheritance, through the filter of that cultural inheritance. And it is this negotiation that is the most interesting part of speculative fiction of these times. And this is something that uh, we realized when we were, so what we did was we actually looked at uh, some of the uh, speculative fiction that I mentioned, and then we understood, tried to understand uh, how we can place it within the larger scientific model that existed in the 19th century. So it can be called a space of negotiation. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, that uh, this model continues and we have uh, uh, that uh, it's not that it completely disappeared. We have speculative fiction even today. So if you look at the contemporary manifestations, uh, is you will see that a huge amount of science fiction writing, science fiction again has become an interesting, uh, or speculative fiction as I have called it, has become an interesting part of our um, have again revived interest in a certain sense in 1980s. So if you look at Amitabh Bush's character of chromosome, which is a um, uh, recent uh, addition to the entire tradition. In Bengal, actually, there's a whole unbroken tradition of science fiction or speculative fiction, right from 1835 till today. So there is a whole tradition of science fiction. I know Maharashtra has a long tradition of science fiction, etc. So you have uh, the recent things like uh, Manjula Padmanabhan's Harvest, uh, Amitabh Ghosh's Calcutta Chromosome, uh, Escape, uh, then of course Generation 14 by Priya Sarukai, Chabria. So you have a tradition of speculative fiction that still continues, uh, Remy Chatterjee's Signal Red or Tashan Mehta's Liar Speed, etc. Now, one of the ways therefore to look at these kind of minor genres is to, to trace the trajectory. That's what we call it. So you look at it historically and how these minor genres, if they continue, uh, some minor genres, for example, disappear. But uh, for example, there was a minor genre in Bengal called uh, a specific kind of a theater which completely disappeared. It came up in 19th century and then disappeared. Uh, why did it disappear? It's interesting to see. But there are, such, uh, there are certain minor genres that actually continue for a very long time. 
uh, speculative fiction is one of them. So it is a it is it will be an interesting thing to to trace the trajectory, uh, trace the historical trajectory of these fictions. Uh, the second thing that mana genres can do is it offers a kind of interesting counterpoint to major genres. Uh, it offers interesting historical insights into the period because when we tend to look at historical context, we tend to look at major forms and not minor forms. The minor forms provides us with that interesting counterpoil to the major forms uh, and therefore can produce interesting research ideas, research areas. Uh, I hope that uh, this short uh, discussion on speculative fiction uh, would kind of generate some interest in some of you and you would be able to go back and look at some of the other minor genres that are available in your own region literatures or in uh, literatures in English available in your own region and uh, you would go back and see whether those kind of be researched from different frameworks. So again, thank uh, Dr. Mote uh, for, um, for having me for this webinar and all the participants uh, looking forward to questions or discussions or whatever we can have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir, click uh, on Q and A. There, there is one question right now, but uh, many more to come. Uh, Yes, I think Dr. Mangukia, there will be. I mean, what I'm calling speculative fiction. So the question is, in Indian English literature, do we have dystopian or utopian novels? Uh, there are. I mean, there are obviously, because the moment you talk about science fiction or speculative fiction, there will be utopian or dystopian. Um, because science fiction, by its very nature, is either utopian or dystopian. Interestingly, in Western science fiction, and that's an interesting oh. contrast that you find. In Western science fiction, you will probably find more dystopian writing, especially after the 1870s and 80s, it's more dystopian. Uh, in Indian science fiction, if you leave aside the recent ones, if you look at early speculative fiction, it is neither uh, utopian nor dystopian. It can be extremely funny at times. It is ironic, it's very humorous, uh, it is subtle, it is satirical, it makes fun of the British model of education. Um, it does all sorts of things. So it's very difficult to classify it as either utopian or dystopian. That's the problem. So recent, if you look at the examples that I gave, uh, that I gave of Amitabh Ghosh or Priya Sarukai, for example, you have utopian dystopian version, definitely. But earlier uh, speculative fiction, 19th century, early 20th century, it's very difficult to classify them as either utopian or dystopian. I hope that answers the question. Okay, yes. we have uh, Dr. Cyril's carrier. Do we have magical realism in Indian fiction? Uh, Are you there, Cyril, ma'am? Uh, yes, go ahead with, yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Atanu, uh, good evening, sir. Actually, uh, it's so nice to see you on this platform, Langley. And uh, your presentation actually was so insightful. Uh, you have explored this topic so well and gave us an insight into it in, with its man, uh, various, uh, you know, manifestations. Actually, uh, many of the things uh, made me think... Um, about and made me have a few questions. Um, science fiction, as you um, explore as a branch, uh, what you said was very interesting. Uh, interesting uh, you said, uh, you said uh, which is which is there are books which uh, which can be you know uh, said like a science fiction but not a science fiction. So it comes into that category. And another thing was oh. um, there was a um, you know differentiation of uh, like Western science fiction and science fiction which uh, is from India or from Eastern uh, part of uh, you know countries. So uh, I'd like to ask you what kind of future do you see 
uh, to the science fiction, especially when it comes to India. Uh, one and the other is, uh, um, I wanted to know something more about uh, another aspect which you dealt with. You said there is a science from women's perspective. So uh, can you please throw some light on the other, on this woman's perspective also, because this is something which is really very interesting and um, uh, you know, uh, could be explored more in some more details. So. Yeah, Dr. Sayaria, thank you. Uh, I, I, okay, I'll try to answer the first one because that's, uh, that will be easier to answer quickly in the sense of the future of science fiction. It's interesting because uh, science fiction in recent times, especially in the West, has um, invited a lot of uh, research interest. So science fiction is back in uh, fashion, back in vogue in that sense. So what you have is, for example, a lot of interest has been now invoked in uh, women science fiction in the West. Uh, so you have writers like Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, you have Octavia Butler, you have Joanna Russ, um, a large number of women writers in recent times, Ada Palmer, for example, uh, who are uh, producing a different sort of a narrative in terms of women's uh, take on science, uh, etc., different from men's take on science. Uh, in India also, since the 1980s, as I said at the end of um, my presentation, there have been quite a lot of writers who have taken up science fiction, including very well-known writers like Amitabh Ghosh, Calcutta Chromosome, for example. Uh, Amitabh Ghosh is not known for science fiction in that sense, but uh, one of the novels that he wrote was uh, kind of speculative science fiction. Uh, but you also have a large number of women writers who are doing it. So the example that I gave uh, in the last few slides, if you, uh, if you notice, uh, many of the writers are women, Manjula Padmanabhan, Remy Chatterjee, um, Priya Sarukai, uh, they're all women who are engaging with a certain kind of science. Uh, so I see that uh, science fiction does have a very, very strong future in India. Uh, though it is now following more of a Western model, so it is either utopian or dystopian, uh, but, and we need to understand that the science fiction that we are seeing today has a historical past. So one of the things that I was trying to do through this uh, webinar, through this presentation was uh, to kind of link those. So there is a historical pause to the science fiction. We need to look at that historical past. The second question about women's uh, science has a huge history, uh, especially in India. Uh, now, it will be very difficult to go through the entire history, but I'll very quickly point out what uh, the major points are. Again, from I'll give you examples from Bengal. One of the earliest debates in Bengal, which started around 1860s, especially after uh, schools and colleges were set up in Bengal, especially for women. Now, one of the things, one of the parts of the debate was how do you, uh, what sort of education should women be given? And there's again a very long debate on that. And one of the parts of that debate was should science be taught to women? And if science were taught to women, what sort of science? Now, on the one hand, there is this huge debate, for example, like, should women get admission to medical colleges? Uh, or should women be uh, only restricted to nursing? So you have, for example, women seats in nursing colleges, but to get into a medical college to study medicine and to become a doctor, it's almost impossible. In fact, one of the earliest doctors in uh, Bengal, uh, I think Devjani Ganguly here, her name was, uh, she become, becomes a doctor in 1875, 1876, uh, one of the earliest women doctors, and it is seen as a major achievement by a woman. Now, remember, these were mostly women who had access to education, who were mostly coming from extremely rich, well-to-do families. Uh, uh, so, when women were responding to science, uh, it's very interesting how they responded to it. And that's why Rukhaya Shakhavat Hussain Sultana's dream is a very interesting one. Because one of the things that she says uh, during the story is that uh, science should actually come to women. Women should only do science. 
because all men have done with science is create violence. That's a very strong statement to make for a woman in 1905. And she's kind of making a statement uh, by saying that science as it has been done by men has only created violence. So the only way that science can operate in a liberating fashion or an emancipatory fashion is through women. So it's not only women's emancipation that science can emancipate women, but actually women who can emancipate science. So it's a very interesting uh, negotiation that is happening when women and science, especially in the early times when they're negotiating. Just to give you an example. I hope that answers your question. Yes, uh, thank you so much for this elaborate answer. And uh, various issues have been generated and we would like to take this to these issues to the new researchers, new people who are coming up with uh, research. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Dr. Prashant, for thank bringing you, Dr. Atanu to us through this platform. Yes, yes. Thank you. Both Pleasure of you. is all mine. Okay. Uh, Rakesh Mishra, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Oh, okay, I can see the question. Uh, I can. Uh, okay, so how do you see the role of Rabindranath Tagore in the late 19th century, early 20th century? Well, Tagore was very clear about science. In fact, in one of his earliest essays in 1894, he almost settled the debate. Because remember, the uh, debate that was happening is whether should we accept Western science, should we not accept Western science. Uh, in the uh, 1894 essay that Tagore wrote, uh, I think it has been translated now. Uh, I know the Bengali title, I don't know how it has been translated, but uh, in the essay, he almost settled the debate. He said that epistemology, uh, or the way you understand the world, uh, is not possible anymore after you have been exposed to a certain kind of scientific modernity, uh, especially Western scientific modernity. So the way you understand the world has changed. There is no way that you can go back to a pristine, pure form of understanding the world, which is Indian in its own sense. Because the moment you have gone through a certain kind of Western education, uh, your way of understanding the world has changed. And therefore, Western science is very clear. The Western science cannot be simply rejected. It's impossible. You might negotiate it in a different way, but no rejection. I mean, there is no possibility of rejecting it because it's all over the world now. So it's very clear about it. Uh, can we call, okay, there is someone, Sumati Salunke, ma'am, uh, she is asking, I think, can we call short stories Katha Sarit Sagar or Panchatantra, minor form of Indian literature? I don't know. Uh, it seems to be major, actually, because Katha Sarit Sagar and Panchatantra actually traveled quite a lot. It is believed that Dekamedha uh, was written because Katha Sarit Sagar and Panchatantra trans, uh, was translated into Arabic. And from the Arab lands, uh, it traveled to Italy during the Renaissance. And that is how, in fact, uh, interesting, uh, because Decameron uh, was written during the plague, uh, just like we are having this webinar during the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, so Decameron was actually modeled on the Kathasarit Saga. So instead of 100 stories or you know, 1,000 stories, uh, you have uh, 10 stories in Decameron. So it's... Uh, so in a sense, probably a major genre. So the short story or the moral fable, or what we know as the moral fable, La Pachatantra, or Jataka Tales, or the Kathasarit Saga, uh, or the Yoga Vashishta, these were all sort of, uh, they traveled quite a lot, uh, right up to Greece in the ancient times. And they produced different sorts of genres. So they probably are major rather than very minor. That's, that's answered. Yes, sir. There are two more questions, sir. Okay. Uh, just click in QA box. I'll take it. Can we treat prison narratives as minor journal? Uh, yes. Okay. 
I don't know whether uh, uh, because one of my students are you are you the same student Nevedita? I'm not very sure uh, <laughs> because one of my student is working on the present narrative. Uh, there is one more by Doctor Nair. Is, to kind of if you are creating a new genre by saying that. Um, Sorry, my internet connection is a bit unstable. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are saying that there is a new genre that is called prison narrative, then you probably will need to differentiate between what you are calling prison narrative because then you are saying that there is a this is a different genre altogether from the memoir or the autobiography or the diary or the testimony. Uh, but if a prison narrative is written in the form of an autobiography or uh, even in the form of a fiction or autobiography. I was just reading uh, Mananjan Bapari, uh, a Dalit writer from Bengal, uh, who wrote about his experience in prison, uh, uh, which, is, which has again been translated very, very recently. I've forgotten the translation. I've got the original text. But anyway, so when it, when it's a kind of fictionalized prison narrative, uh, then it might be called a new genre. But if it is more of a memoir, then you will have to have very strong reasons to call it a different genre altogether. Because if it's a memoir of a prison, prison, then then is it a memoir? Is it a prison narrative? If it is a prison narrative, is it under the umbrella of the memoir, etc.? So uh, those things will have to be uh, looked at. Uh, Dr. Nair Jahan's question is: Can we consider Harry Potter as science fiction? Well, I, I would consider it as a fantasy. I would consider it as a speculative fiction. Uh, about science fiction, I'm not very sure. It's a fantasy, definitely. So speculative fiction will have fantasy. It will have uh, fabulous modes of telling. Uh, it sometimes will have uh, young adult fiction. Uh, it will also have science fiction. Uh, but uh, the Potter series probably will come into the fantasy part rather than science fiction part. Uh, I don't know the name because I think it's a phone uh, that is... Galaxy 7. J yeah. So what is the major difference between the women and men writers in a way they explore science fiction? I think I've already touched upon this a bit uh, by uh, talking about uh, women's response to science. But, uh, well, men, I don't know whether the basic difference is the way men approach science or how women approach science. But this is going to be a very long answer, so I would rather not answer it right now because it's it's a, it's going to be a very long answer because there's a huge amount of literature available in it. But I would request you to go back to uh, a huge amount of what is known as feminist science fiction. So writers like Joanna Russ, uh, writers like Octavia Butler, right? writers like Ursula K. Le Guin have written extensively on uh, women's science fiction. Uh, or uh, Margaret Atwood, for that matter, uh, which is uh, a very different kind of science fiction from the so-called traditional men's science fiction. Uh, so if you look at Philip K. Dick or um, A.G. Wells or Jules Verne, it's a very different kind of a conquering expansionist science fiction. Uh, women's science fiction actually posits a very different kind of a feminist self altogether, especially in recent times. So there is a, a massive difference. Is there another question? So oh. there are two questions on YouTube oh. channel. Okay. okay, please. I don't have access to. That. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, can you please suggest some minor journals in the context of Gujarat? The context of Gujarat, minor yes. genres. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when my Gujarati is a bit shaky, I am afraid. <laughs> so, but. Uh, some of my colleagues, if you are interested, I mean, I've given my email ID. So you could just write, some of my colleagues are working on minor genres in Gujarat. Uh, so I can redirect you to them. You to them. Uh, they'll be more than happy to help you if you would like to have a chat with them. Okay, there is another one. How does science fiction relate itself from fantasy? In Indian context, that's the difficulty. I mean, that's why I said that it's 
probably better to use the word speculative fiction than science fiction uh, in India, because in Indian context, if you if you do not look into the contemporary uh, things that are happening, especially of 1980s and 1990s, if you look at the early forms of writing that we can call science fiction, it is probably speculative because it is a mix of fantasy and science fiction. So it's very difficult to kind of distinguish between fantasy and science fiction in the Indian context. In the Western context, it's more or less pretty clear. In recent times, not very clear. But if you look at early classic science fiction, it's very clear. So science fiction uh, has been very clearly defined by theoreticians who have worked on science fiction. So science fiction must have a scientific logic. It must have a novum, which is basically a kind of a scientific world. Uh, either in the future or in the past, or uh, it has to be utopian or dystopian. It must, uh, so even if it is in the future, it must have a scientific uh, explanation of things happening. It should not look like fantasy. There should be a scientific uh, epistemology, a scientific knowledge system behind the explanation, etc. A fantasy can be, uh, is very different. Uh, the fantastic is something that Rowling does, for example. Uh, the fantastic is something uh, that um, later Rowling, especially with her uh, fantastic beasts, for example, does. Or Lord of the Rings is, is a fantasy. Now, you can't really call it a science fiction because many of the things cannot be explained scientifically. One of the primary functions of a science fiction is that even though things have not, do not exist now, they can still have the logic of science. So they do not look absurd. Uh, fantastic does not have need to have a logic of science. So that's the basic difference. Okay, thank you, sir. There is another question by Mega Singh. Do you think introduction of science fiction as a compulsory paper in higher education will encourage researcher in the field, particularly after post-COVID India? Uh, actually, uh, the a large number of engineering uh, colleges in, uh, I don't know whether a large number of them, but at least I know of a few teachers over here have introduced science fiction in the engineering colleges. And they feel that uh, uh, the students, the science students especially find it interesting when, uh, whenever they are doing communication skills or uh, are learning English as a subject, because otherwise they find it extremely boring. Uh, in terms of actual uh, revision in papers, I think fantasy and science fiction is there in almost all revised syllabuses now. Uh, it's become an inter because it's become a part of popular literature and popular literature is part of almost many, many university syllabi. So I think it's become a part of syllabi across many states and many universities. I think we are done with the questions. Uh, there is one in the chat box, sir. Uh, this is from Dr. Skaria again. Is yes, it? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you there, sir? Yes, yes, I'm there. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So there is one before that by Dr. Janani Yu, I think. Uh, she says that essays have lost its importance nowadays. Uh, yes, but essays have kind of developed into these academic forms of writing now. So we all of us write academic essays, uh, not the personal essays. Yes, personal essays. So personal essays have taken the forms of blogs now, for example, or, or, or now. So tweets are kind of personal essays, especially a long thread on a tweet is a kind of personal essay. So it's taken a different technological form. Uh, coming back to Dr. Skaria's uh, question about... Uh, is there online? Yes, sir. So yes, sir. You can one ask of those minor question. genres which are about to go extinct. Um, I'm not very sure. I'm, I don't really know because it seems that many genres that come into existence do not really go extinct they transform into something else. So the example that I gave from 19th century Bengal was a specific kind of a theater genre called Naksha. Now, Naksha or Naksha, as it is called, is actually drew from the Persian form of dramatic satire called Naksha. Uh, 
Now, in the Persian theatre, it became different forms of Dastan Goi, for example, is one of the forms of Naksha. In Bengal, the form of Naksha became satirical theatre. So, it, by 1890s, one of the most famous uh, writers of satirical theatre was a person in Bengal called Amrit Lal Basu. So, what he did was he actually took the form of the Naksha and made it into absolutely strong satirical theatre. So satire, be Naksha became satire. So I don't know whether uh, genre completely goes extinct. And I, I'm not very sure whether, because I, I think it transforms. It doesn't really go extinct in that sense. Yes, sir. OK, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mathe. It was wonderful to have you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Honorable Sir, for your thought provoking, informative, insightful, and interactive session on uh, researching minor genres, some reflections. We thoroughly enjoyed and learned a lot from your session. Thank you very much, one and all, for your active participation by log logging Zoom room always full and those who are watching on YouTube channel and made this lecture series a grand, grand success. Let's learn, unlearn, and relearn together. It's another thought-provoking and stimulating learning together. Langlet Lecture Series believes in the philosophy to learn from each other, grow together, and spread happiness. Be safe, happy, and healthy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir.